and uh, we thank you so very much. Well, if you have your Bibles open to James chapter 2, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for the blessed days of this week that you've already extended to us. And we thank you, Lord, that it's time once again to study your precious word. For me, it just seems like we just did it. And I know that people feel that time flies when they're having fun as well. We pray tonight, Lord, that you bless this study in such a way that, Lord, help us to learn something tonight. Help us, Lord, to grasp these spiritual truths and not only hear them, Lord, but apply them to our lives. And as always, if there's just one person watching tonight that doesn't know Christ, it'd be worth it all to open our Bibles to James chapter 2 to have someone give their hearts to Christ. So Lord, I pray as the Holy Spirit speaks to us through the Word, maybe with great conviction you're working already in somebody's heart, drawing them to the Savior. And we pray right now in our spirit for that person or those people. Now we ask that your blessings would be upon the Bible study. May the Holy Spirit give us anointing, unction, liberty, power, clarity. Help us, Lord, to proclaim your word tonight in truth. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we want to continue tonight where we left off last week. And I want you to look. I'm going to read verse 12 and uh, it will lead us into verse number 13, where we will pick up tonight. In James 2, verse 12, So speak ye, and so do, as they that might be judged by the law of liberty. This is talking about God's grace now. For he shall have judgment, look at this, without mercy, that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. And let me say, and we basically left off with this frame of thought last Wednesday night that every one of us need mercy in our life. We all do. And how wonderful it is when you're shown mercy. You know when something's about ready to come your way and you know you're worthy of whatever the chips may be that fall. You know that it's clear as day that what is about to happen is the result of your own fault. But in the 11th hour, what you deserved somehow was detoured or in the case of a believer in applying it in a spiritual context, where the hand of God stated, we know we deserved it, but mercy walked in the room. All of us know what it's like to be the recipients of mercy. God extended mercy to you and I. But I will tell you this, when it comes to our everyday living, remember now, All of us are the same. All of us are equal. All of us were created in the express image of God. And so if we want to be shown mercy in our lives, then we have got to be willing to show mercy to others. Now that's clear as day in the Word. And I want you to get that spiritual truth. I want you to see what I'm talking about tonight. I want you to go back with me to the Gospel of Matthew, and I want to read uh, several passages of Scripture for you in Matthew chapter 18. And I want you to look beginning at verse number 21, because this is dealing with the law of forgiveness and, and how that works in exchange with one another. And so look with me in Matthew chapter 18, and I'm going to read verse 21 down through 35. So it's a few verses. Stay with me. Stay focused. And let's see what God's word says about this tonight. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times seven. Now Peter was always seemingly to be in a spot where he was vigorous and aggressive 
and in some cases impatient. And so maybe perhaps even Peter, when he was asking this question, he's saying, look, Lord, I put up with this guy for I don't know how many times, at least seven. As far as I'm concerned, I'm done. You ever said that? Concerning somebody, I'm done. I'm done. I know what you mean and I know how you feel. I found myself in those done situations as well. But look what Jesus said. In verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto these until seven times seven, but until 70 times seven. What does that mean, preacher? That means you just keep on going with it. Well, what if he or she just keeps on doing it? Then you keep on forgiving. Now look at this. Verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had, not to pay his Lord, commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But look at this. You know the story. You're well familiar with it. Hard to believe, but true. Verse 28, but the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. Look at this. He was just forgiven. This guy was just forgiven of a debt that he couldn't pay. He was about to lose everything he had. He fell down and begged for mercy. And he was given mercy. He gets up from that tear-jerking situation. He goes about his business and he runs into a guy that owed him money. He was just shown mercy. He was just forgiven. And the guy that just experienced all of these emotions. He runs into the man who owed him money, and the Bible says he grabbed a man by the throat and began to demand his, his money. Now look at this. He took him by the throat in verse 28, the latter part, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me. Sounds familiar. This guy just said the same thing to his master. He besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And look at this. Can you believe this? This is verse 30 now. And he would not. Now, this guy was just crying crocodile tears. He was pleading for his life, the livelihood of his family, saying, Please, please, please have mercy on me. Forgive me, please. And the Bible says, He would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told him to their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. You begged me. You pleaded with me. You were at the end of your rope. You had no options. Have you ever been in a place where you had no more options? That's where this guy was. He was completely destitute with everything. He had no hope to see in the sunset. He had no hope of seeing the sunrise the next morning. All was lost. He begged his master to forgive him. And the word says he did gladly. And so notice this in verse 33. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? He said, I forgave you. That should have been a crystal clear lesson for you. 
when you got up off of your knees and you dried your tears and you consoled your family and you had hope of another day, you had hope of another tomorrow, the burdens of life were lifted and now you were in a position to smile for the first time in a long time. And the very first thing you do is to grab somebody by the throat and say, hey, pay me my money. The master here is saying, you should have had pity on him like I had pity on you. You should have extended mercy to him as I extended mercy to you. In verse 34, and his Lord was wroth and delivered him unto the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Now look at this, verse 35. This is the application to what we just read in James 13, 2, 13. So all of this now is a heavenly, a spiritual truth, a spiritual application. That whole story comes down to this, verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespass. Think about that. That's why we mentioned a few moments ago that if you want mercy in your life, then you, you have to learn how to show and express mercy to others. Now go back to James 2 verse 13 and you get the idea from Matthew chapter 18. Now apply that last verse in verse 35 to what James is saying here in verse number 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy. If that's the attitude that he had showed no mercy and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. And so I want you to look at this. James is teaching here that a person who makes no allowances for others when we're all equal, when we're all the same, then James has said, we'll find that no allowance will be made for them either. All right, now let's look at verse number 14 as we continue to study the word tonight. James 2, 14, what doth it profit? You know, that reminds me of the other scripture that says, what shall it profit a man? If he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Look at this. For what doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, James is getting ready to teach us spiritual truths about faith and about works. Both of them are important. Both of them are necessary. Let's look at this. If faith is only something we talk about, and it goes back to a little earlier study, not only to be hearers of the word, talkers of the word, but doers of the word. And so if faith is something that we only talk about, then James is saying this, if that's as far as you're going to take your faith, just a mere conversation, then James is saying this, then your faith is dead. And, and it works the same way for us. Listen, if, if I got in the pulpit and I just began to preach and preach and preach and preach and never practice what I preached, if I were to tell you this, that the just shall live by faith, and without faith it's impossible to please God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If I were to just get in the pulpit and preach those things and never trusted God myself, never stepped out on faith myself, never believed God in the darkest hour, never believed God in the good times or bad times. Listen, if, if all I did was talk about faith, and that is far as I ever took it, then according to the word of God, my faith would be dead. Look at this. Dead faith is a profession without possession. Can you think through that just for a moment? Dead faith is merely a profession 
without possession. People make professions of faith all the time for all kinds of reasons. I I have spent time counseling in my office in years gone by. People get themselves in trouble, and the first thing they want to do is come to Jesus. And then when we get it all patched up, fixed up, everything's great, they're gone. You don't know where they are. People are very easily making professions. But a profession of faith without possession of that faith, faith without works is dead. If that's all that it is, listen carefully. In in the days and times of James, when he was preaching these particular spiritual truths, there were those in the church who were taking things into what I would call blind extremes. You see, the Jews were placing all of their emphasis all of their emphasis on works. That's predominantly what the Jehovah's Witness do today. Even in the Mormon church, there's an enormous amount of emphasis placed on work. Now, we're going to get to how important works are. I'm not saying works aren't important. Believe me, they are, and they're crucial and critical. But we don't place everything on works alone. And and I don't want to get ahead of myself tonight, and we'll get into that. So, but James was dealing with this. The Jews were putting an enormous emphasis on works, while at the same time, there were others who were not putting any emphasis on works. And so that's what he was contending with. Have you ever met someone who said that they were a believer but yet they lived totally contradictory to that declaration. Again, have you ever met somebody who said they were saved, but did not live like they were saved? Can you identify with that? You have any idea what I'm talking about tonight? I mean, listen carefully. What we do, how we live, testifies about the realness of our faith. That's critical. Any declaration of faith does not, listen carefully, any declaration of faith that does not result in a changed life unto good works is a false declaration. Now, I want to say that again. It's a lot in that statement, and I want you to think it through with me. But it is the gospel truth. Any declaration of faith that does not result in a changed life unto good works is a false declaration. And we're going to see more about that in a moment. Now I want to read verse 15 and 16 together. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Somebody comes to you and says, I'm hungry and I have a need. Uh, We've been feeding people for the last week or two here at the church. Thank you for bringing your can items in, by the way. I I will tell you now that our cupboards are almost bare. we've, We've fed two families last week. We got them going to another payday. And it's because of your generosity you've been bringing your canned goods in. And when you do, we stock the shelves. When we give it out, the shelves go empty, and they're pretty bare right now. So if you could bring some more stuff in, that would be great. But James is saying this, what what good is it if if a person who is hungry, they come to you, they have a need, whatever the need, they come to you and say, let's use food for an example. They come to you and say, I'm hungry, and you're saying, oh, brother, let me pray for you. 
And then you pray the prayer and you say, God bless you. I hope you find some food. James is saying, what good is that? What kind of profit comes out of that? And look at this in verse 17. Even so, faith, if it had not works, is dead being alone. So here's the thing. Somebody comes to you and says, I'm hungry. And you say, well, brother, be thou fed. I hope somebody gives you a chicken leg. Some, I, I hope somebody buys you a Big Mac. God bless you. Listen, somebody comes to you and says they're hungry. Okay, then you put some action to that. You put some work to that. You you help them out. I Gail, she amazes me sometimes when she tells me these things. She don't tell me all things all the time, but I will tell you this. She has told me from time to time, she pulls up to these red lights and she sees what appears to be homeless people. Now listen, I know the scam, you know the scam. There's a lot of people standing on street corners saying, I will work for food or I'm homeless or whatever it is. And you know good and well that they probably got, they probably got alcohol in their bag got cigarettes popping out their shirt pocket. They're probably taking that money and doing whatever with it. Who, who knows? I mean, that's not what we judge. That's not what we do. But Gail, she'll pull up to these stoplights and find these what appears to be homeless people, beggars, paupers, and she gives them money all the time. Now listen, somebody comes to you and says, I'm hungry, and you say, Be thou fed, old brother. Go your way and be thou fed. But here's the thing. Somebody comes to you and says, listen, I, I have a need and, and, and I'm hungry. Now let me tell you what the way that I've worked it. And, and she does too from time to time. But we have people coming to the church all the time saying, listen, and I, I got a station wagon full of kids out here. And I don't have any gas in my car. We had an eight in two days. Can you help us out? And I'll say, sure. Absolutely. You come to the right place. And I said, give me just a moment and uh, let me button up my office. I said, I'm going to take you right down here to the corner and I'll get you some gasoline. I'll fill your car up with gas. Then I'll take you right across the street to the Golden Corral. You bring all this crowd in here and you just eat till you can't eat anymore. And, and believe me, I have had people to say to me in that very same story. Oh, whoa, 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 preacher. Yeah, I don't, I don't want, I don't want you to do that. I don't want the gas. I don't want the food. I just want the money. And then I say, my friend, I cannot help you because I'm not going to contribute to what apparently is a downfall, character flaws and so forth. Have no problem taking them to a gas station, me paying for the gas, letting them pump the gas, me taking them for food and me buying the food. I have no problem with that, but I'm just not going to handle money. I, that's happened too many times. And listen, I'm not responsible. Even if, even if we took somebody to the gas station and we took somebody to the Golden Corral and with their good fortune, they went to a casino that night and lottery ticket, all of their savings or whatever it is. I'm not responsible for that. I have a responsibility to do this. If somebody comes to me and says, I'm hungry, I, I don't just say, well, brother, be thou fed. I have a responsibility to do something about that. That's part of works with my faith. And that's what James is talking about here. And Paul, this is what he spoke about, and this is what James speaks about. Here James is speaking about, in verse 17, even so faith, if it hath not works, look at this, is dead, being alone. In fact, I want to share a passage of Scripture with you here, if I can turn to it real quickly. And it's found in the book of Hebrews. And I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 14. I believe this is the Scripture that I want. Hebrews 9, 14. Actually, I want to read one before that. 
Hebrews chapter 6, and I quoted this verse just a minute ago, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Look at that, dead works, and faith toward God. There's a difference between profession and possession. We've already talked about that tonight. And uh, I believe Paul here is talking about dead works. A difference between works and uh, faith toward God. But now look at chapter 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, dead works, to serve the living God. So, back in James chapter 2, verse number 17, James is talking about this. And he's putting some emphasis on works, and he's talking a little bit about dead works. All right, so now notice verse number 18. He said, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. He said, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So James is saying that all some people do is to say that they have faith, but they really do not live to back that up. They have nothing to back that up with. Just a lot of talk. You've heard the old saying, you can talk the talk, but there's a big difference when you walk the walk. Somebody say amen right here. Now, look at verse number 19. Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devil's also believe and tremble. This is a powerful verse of Scripture, and I want to spend some time with it. I don't believe that I'll come close to getting through this particular verse tonight. But it's a, it's a powerful spiritual truth here. And listen carefully. Look, look at this again. Thou believest that there is one God. Let me assure you of something, that the devil has never argued the scripture. The devil has never debated the scripture. This is a classic verse of scripture which the devil, if he were, which he's not, if he were in the custom of saying amen, this would be a scripture that he would say amen. Thou believest that there is one God. That scripture has never been debated by Satan. In fact, the devil knows this scripture to be so true that he could reminisce about when it was the time to afflict the great servant of God, Job. According to the scripture, the devil had to get this one God's permission to do that. And so listen carefully, the devil and the demons of hell not only believe that there is one God, and we're going to see more of this in the study to come, they not only believe that there is only one God, but they know that this one God has an eternal punishment, an eternal judgment that's speeding towards them like a speeding bullet, like a train without brakes. They know this. And I don't have time to get into this part of the scripture tonight. I believe this is a place where we'll take some time to end the study, but I hope that you understand what we're talking about tonight. There's a big difference between a profession of faith, and the possession of faith. There's one thing to proclaim you have faith, but it's another thing to manifest what you declare by what you do. 
not simply by what you say, but by what you do. And I've referred to this many times in this study. Actions speak louder than words. James is re-emphasizing what Paul did in many passages of Scripture, that faith without works is dead. Faith without action, without movement, without feet, without hands, without eyes, without intellect. Faith without works is dead. And dead faith is vain faith. Now, next Wednesday night, Lord willing, I'm going to continue this subject and we'll be looking in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8 and also a passage in Revelation chapter 20. I've really enjoyed the study thus far. Again, chapter 2 is enlightening in many ways. It fits the day and the time, the age where we are right now. And I pray that these spiritual truths have have encouraged you, been a blessing to you, has motivated you, maybe turned a light on in some area of your life, something that you've pondered, you've reconsidered, you've thought about. And, and that's my goal, that's my desire, that the Word of God, the Bible study would do just that. So I want to ask you tonight as we close the Bible study this evening, what are you doing about your faith? What are you doing with your faith? The Bible teaches us that we cannot be stuck on a hill and hiding our light under a bushel, but to let our light so shine that others and all can see the good works of the Lord Jesus. Now, aren't you glad? that when God looked down on this sin-cursed world, He didn't say, I hope you make it. Aren't you glad He didn't say, do your best? Aren't you glad that when God looked down on this sin-cursed world, that He didn't just see it and say, be thou fit? God looked down and saw our need, and aren't you glad that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Aren't you willing that God looked down and he gave a declaration, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Aren't you glad he was willing that none should perish but that all would come to repentance? You see, God put actions to what he said, how he felt. That's what God expects us to do in our life. When we make the declaration that we have trusted Christ as our personal Savior, then our life should testify by the good works that we know that are in the Scripture Those good works, the works do not save us. And Paul and James uses two different analogies, and we'll go through that in these next few verses to come. But listen, the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of your works. But when you are saved by faith, you shine the light on that, you you are able to demonstrate that, you are able to prove that, you are able to testify that because of what you do. Your good works, they manifest and puts the polish on your declaration that yes, I am one of his. He is mine, I am his forever. I am saved, born again, bought with a price, I've been redeemed. And because I have, listen, I don't work to be saved. I work because I'm saved. I hope that helps you tonight. Well, it's a good place to stop. May the Lord bless you.